Today, as I told you, we are talking about dynamic mechanisms once again. And uh, last week we began talking about it. We talked about what, why do we need dynamic mechanisms, what kind of problems require the use or warrant the use of dynamic mechanisms. And we also introduced the solution for the problem of, of implementing the efficient allocation rule in a dynamic setting. So we have talked about the dynamic pivot mechanism. And uh, we began working on an example. I asked you to continue or suggested that you continue working on this example at home. Right. But today uh, we will no longer be talking about dynamic pivot mechanism. We will not be continuing with that example. Instead, we will move on to the other class of problem that we considered in the static contexts, and we will see how that works in dynamic contexts. So, yes, today we're talking about dynamic optimal mechanisms and dynamic revenue maximization. And the bottom line of today, of this topic, will be pretty much the same as last week, meaning nothing fundamentally changes in the dynamic setting, but there are just a few issues that you should be aware of and a few useful life hacks that you can use. But fundamentally, at the core of the dynamic optimal mechanism, we will have the same Meyerson mechanism with the virtual surplus. And we will be effectively maximizing the virtual surplus. So, the main example that we are talking about today, once again, we will frame the question slightly more narrowly. You know, in the context of a particular problem. So we will talk about some kind of dynamic pricing. And in principle, there is a huge literature on dynamic pricing in IO and in theory. And it is more or less related to dynamic mechanisms. So we will obviously not cover, we will not even dip our toes in there. We will kind of look at, at it from afar. But the survey uh, that we are Basing on the Bergman and Bellamacchi survey, uh, does it present some applications from that literature in the context of the framework that we will be working in? So, for examples, go to the survey, and we will we will not have any examples today either. I'm afraid. I told you it would be a scary lecture. So I told you that the static optimal mechanism lecture would probably be the hardest. So with dynamic optimal mechanisms, it's only natural that it's the second hardest lecture. Right. So to, to give some uh, examples of particular settings of where we can encounter a similar question of how, how, how to design dynamic optimal mechanism that extracts all revenue from the buyer, uh, with binding contracts especially, meaning that the buyer cannot easily back out of the contract, Mobile service and telecom contracts in general often feature this, you know, you cannot back out uh, in the next six months and we give you some appealing pricing instead, but we can change the pricing instead. Insurance, loans are also kind of similar thing. So your rates on mortgage can change over time, uh, depending again on what kind of mortgage you have, uh, and you cannot that easily back out of it unless you want to refinance, to repay your mortgage and take another mortgage and so on. But basically, this is the kind of examples that I want you to think about. So the question that we will be working on in particular is as follows. There is one buyer with time changing valuation theta for the item or for the product. And we'll be designing the seller optimal mechanism for, well, two class of problems. Either repeated purchases, meaning that we have a buyer that comes to us every day, wants to buy mobile service every month or so, and we want to extract this buyer's valuation for our mobile service. Especially as it changes over time, we want to maybe fluctuate the pricing for mobile service. Right? The other class of problems that we'll consider is the one-time purchase meaning uh, we have a potential buyer who wants to buy a car from us, but their valuation for the car is changing over time and we want to just sell them the car 
at the time when we can extract the most money out of them. So a relatively simple setting, just one buyer, one product. Uh, we will assume that the seller has no valuation for the item ever, just to simplify things a little bit further. And this is the kind of question that we'll have. So once again, the, as I said, the main insight will be the same as in static model. So we will have to trade off efficiency, meaning maximizing the surplus from trade against the cost of incentives, the cost of providing incentives to reveal their type truthfully. And this trade-off will be captured by virtual surplus, and we will have this virtual surplus in our game. The important feature of the dynamic mechanisms that we will see is that we will want to distinguish between two kinds of information, or two, yeah, two kinds of information depending on the timing of this information. Meaning, as we will see, or as we will argue, we will only really want to extract the information that the buyer had when they come to us to sign the contract. So when they first buy our mobile service, when they first get a loan, and so on. And we do not really care about the information that the buyer will receive after this point. Because we will kind of wave our hands and say that we can extract all this information completely for free. Cool. So let's quickly take a step back and recall how it went in the static framework. We already started on this path today. Let's do some more of that. So in static, optimal mechanism, the Myerson's optimal mechanism, what we had is that the expected revenue in this kind of problem, so if we're just selling one item in one period to one buyer, could be represented as uh, follows. So as the surplus of the buyer, it's real utility from trade, minus the cost of providing incentives, which is given by this inverse hazard rate, times the derivative of B with respect to K. No, with respect to theta. theta. So we did not derive this exact expression, but we derived this expression for the special case of multiplicative real utility B. So if V of K theta is just K theta, then the expression above reduces to K of theta times the virtual surplus So basically, when k was this binary decision to trade or not to trade, well, with some something in between like probabilities, you wanted to trade when virtual surplus was positive, you wanted to not trade when virtual surplus was negative, and so on. Now, I will introduce semi-deliberately an inconsistency that will confuse you, and I'm sorry for that. But from this point onwards, since we're kind of just, we're adopting this a tiny bit more general model. It's not like you can have many other different Vs except for this multiplicative one in the context of trade. But we will just use Vs to pretend to be general. And for that sake, I will just call this whole bracket virtual surface. So not divided by key, by K but the whole thing. And this is the notational inconsistency. Yeah, 
I realize it's annoying and confusing, and sorry for that, but I have not found any other better way. So once again, the bottom line of this exercise in the static setting was that this virtual surplus had to trade off the gains from trade minus the cost of providing incentives, and that's the same thing that we'll do here. So that's lesson one. Now for lesson two, well, let's, lesson one. Lesson two is that we want to have this distinction between exante and arriving information. I don't have good labels for that, but the information that the player had before setting up to the mechanism and the information the player acquires after. As I said, we will be able to extract pretty much all information that arrives after the point of signing the contract. And to, I will prove this point to you via a toy example, which is in no way a proof and is in no way really convincing. But it's the best we can do given the time constraints. And trust me, you don't really want to go in there. So the example is as follows. Consider, once again, a static optimal mechanism problem, the Meyerson problem, with just one buyer, one item, one period. I think that's all the ones we need. And there is no outside option of the item for the seller. The only difference that we will take from this static optimal mechanism problem is we will assume that the buyer learns their valuation for the item, theta, after signing up the contract, after deciding whether to participate in the mechanism. And so let's try to solve this problem now. The seller's problem is the same as before. So the seller wants to maximize overall possible mechanisms, KT. The expectation of the transfers that the, that the agent pays to the mechanism, that the buyer pays to the mechanism. Subject to the constraints, um, which are IC condition, once again, with one buyer, we don't care about the distinction between Bayesian and dominant strategy, IC. So it's just the incentive compatibility condition. And it means that K of theta times theta minus T of theta is weakly greater than K of theta hat times theta minus T of theta hat for any theta and theta hat. And we also have the participation constraint, meaning that the expected utility of the buyer from participating in the mechanism must be, say, non-negative. So the outside option of the buyer is zero as well. Again. So who can tell me what's the difference between this problem and the Meyerson's optimal mechanism problem in terms of the objective function of the seller and the constraints in his problem. It is the IR, the IR condition that is different. And the only thing that's different is this expectation. Right? If we need to convince the buyer who knows their type to participate in the mechanism, regardless of their type, then we need to satisfy this condition for all types of the buyer. Now, the buyer does not know theta before they, they are signing up. So we actually uh, only want to make it worth it to the buyer to participate in the mechanism on average over their types. But the IC condition and the objective functions are pretty much the same. So you would think it's just this modification. What does it change, really? IR has rarely played anywhere. It has definitely not really determined the shape of the mechanism that we are using. In GVCG there was this constant that we changed, but it's not, it's not a meaningful really change. 
So I guess it's it's useless to ask uh, what what the optimal mechanism here is. But okay. So the answer here is if we if the buyer does not know their type, then what we can do is we can yeah let's take a look back at what I raised just the fundamental core of the optimal mechanism uh, the fundamental trade-off in the optimal mechanism the more surplus from trade there is the more you can extract on the other hand the you need to provide incentives for the player to reveal type truthfully so my claim is in this case, the incentive problem is not really there. So what you can do is you can choose the efficient allocation rule K-star. So basically give the item to the buyer whenever valuation is positive. Right? What this will do is it, this will maximize the gains from trade. But since the buyer does not really know what the gains from trade are, the buyer cannot really lie right now about what they are and given that at the at this second stage when the buyer is already forced to be in the mechanism since we are doing the best thing for the buyer the efficient thing for the buyer the buyer has no reason to misrepresent his type so the solution is Uh, use the allocation rule that maximizes the buyer's utility. So, for those of you who did mix up the problem of implementing the efficient outcome and the problem of maximizing revenue, this will not help because this is where they overlap. So we can use this allocation rule to maximize the buyer's surplus from trade. And then what we can do is we can just extract this whole surplus at the ex ante stage in expectation. So we use this efficient allocation rule K star and for transfers we just use the expectation, the expected utility that the buyer gets. <clears throat> yeah, so once again, the bottom line of this example is it shows you that you can extract any information that the buyer receives after signing the contract for free. Because what you can do is you can use the efficient allocation rule, which maximizes the single buyer's utility. So you say, if you participate in the contract, I will do what's best for you. I commit to that. And if I say that, then you have no incentive to lie once you're in the mechanism. But then, of course, I have my own interest in this. And this interest is extracting all this benefit that you get from participating in the contract. And I do this by just asking you to pay however you think you will value participation in the mechanism on average. How can we see that this solution is the one that maximizes the revenue for the seller? Good, yeah. We can, we can actually answer this. So let's do this. Um, I guess proof that this is the optimal mechanism. And by this, I mean this T and this K star. By just looking at the IR constraint, we can have the upper bound on our expected transfers, on our expected revenue. Expected transfer T of theta must be quickly smaller than the expectation of k of theta times theta. 
And so we do not, we have this upper bound on the transfers, but k can be different things. So the efficient k actually maximizes this right hand side. So we also know that for any allocation rule k of theta, this expectation of k of theta times theta is weakly smaller than the expectation for the efficient allocation rule k of theta times theta. So therefore, in any mechanism that is individually rational according to this definition, so exactly individually rational, we cannot extract more from the buyer than they expect to get under the efficient allocation rule. Our mechanism gives exactly that revenue, so it's, it achieves this upper bound. So we cannot feasibly hope to get any, any more from any IR mechanism. Why is there no incentive for the buyer to lie, uh, to use slightly smaller, smaller theta? So, I guess this was the proof of optimality, uh, proof of IC, then you're asking for, yeah. would be as follows. So we want uh, this condition to hold. What we know is that in this mechanism, the transfer does not actually depend on theta. So the IC condition reduces to k of theta times theta must be weakly greater than k of theta hat times theta. Just from the way we defined it. So we set the transfer to be equal to this expectation. Yeah. Right? This is the expected value of this over theta. The buyer could just report something else and pay the exact same transfer. So this is the transfer as a function of the report. No, 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 so, yeah, I guess this is the right way to write it. Again, the right-hand side is the expectation of this expression over theta. So you can, we can, uh, yeah, we can rewrite this as follows. Let's maybe rewrite it as an integral. That would be slightly clearer. So an integral over some s from k of s times s d f of s. So you can see once we integrate away the theta, once we take expectation over theta, this is just a constant. This will not depend on theta. So this is the same expression for all thetas. That's it. Our transfer is the same. Yeah. So OK, your confusion, I think, is following from the timing of the model. The timing is as follows. First, uh, the seller chooses k and t. Then the buyer decides whether to participate. Only at stage three, buyer learns. Then buyer reports some theta hat. And at stage five, k of theta hat and t of theta hat are implemented. So the question is, if if you know that uh, k of any positive theta is 1, gives you the item, then you would just report epsilon. You do not care what, what thing to report, because regardless of what theta you will report, you will get the item in this allocation rule. Right? k star is 1 for any positive theta. And your transfer, what you pay, does not depend on your report, as we've just discussed. So you do not care which positive theta to report, as long as you have positive theta. So you might as well report the truth. And that brings us back to the discussion of what does it mean to implement something? What does it mean for, uh, yeah, for the mechanism to be a truth, to be incentive compatible? And what we mean by that, always in this course, is that there is one equilibrium in which truth telling occurs. So we do not care if there are some other equilibria. And obviously, in this example, there are other equilibria in which if you have positive theta, you report some other random positive theta. 
and that's it. But we say that you know if there is some equilibrium, we're fine. We'll just ask people to report truthfully, and they do not have any good reason to do otherwise. This is kind of the approach. Yes, if your valuation ends up being very low or maybe even negative, yeah. if, if it's negative, you have still already paid the participation ah. price, right? Yeah. So it's like a ticket to ride. Yeah. And then you can enjoy the ride or you can hate it. But you have already paid the price. Yeah. So yes, it is not exposed individually rational. No. But the whole point is we do not care about that. You have signed the contract, you are forced to take this ride. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, telecom contracts work like that. You sign a six month contract and you cannot back out. If, even even if the internet is crap and they take, and it, yeah, you have disconnects every day. That's basically how all American telecoms work. Basically, the idea is. Yeah, sometimes you do learn your evaluation after uh, either after you decide to participate in the mechanism, or maybe you do not learn all of your evaluation, but it just changes somehow. The point of this example is to argue that if your evaluation changes during your participation in the mechanism, then we can extract this new information easily. So you do not need to be completely unaware of what your evaluation is before participating in the mechanism. Once again, the main claim of this example and the main takeaway from today, the main claim of this example is to say that the designer can extract all of buyer's future information at no cost, all the information that the buyer gets after signing up for the mechanism. And I will call this future extraction, and initially I called it information extraction, so because there's at least one place where I did not change it. So this, once again, is a statement. I have kind of waved my hands and proved it with this example. I showed you that this is, in general, a sensible idea, but we will not prove it formally. If anything, there is no really good proof of that. So, yeah, the, the idea here is that we sell the item at the exact expected value. And, uh, yeah, if that statement is true, then all we need to do in our dynamic optimal mechanism the only non-trivial thing we need to do is we need to somehow extract this initial information, so the initial type theta zero that the buyer has before or at the time of participating in the mechanism. And we will extract that using pretty much the Myerson optimal mechanism with some minor modifications. So in the initial period, we will have some distorted allocation rule in order to provide incentives for the buyer to reveal theta zero truthfully. But as time goes on, our allocation will come closer and closer to the efficient one, as in the example that we had. So once again, it sounds reasonable, but it's not a formal statement. And most of the literature is currently at the stage, well, let's kind of hope that this statement is true. And what, what can we do then? What is the mechanism then? So in particular, the protocol for the problem is first solve the dynamic problem as if all future information is public, publicly known, meaning that all the information that the buyer gets to observe about their own theta is also available to the seller. So we make this assumption, we solve the whole problem, and this is of course the quick and easy step. Uh, that might take a few hours on the exam. Once we do that, we get some allocation and transfers. And then we take this allocation and these transfers and we check. Is the mechanism dynamically incentive compatible? So does the statement actually work? Is it true that we can extract all future information easily? Meaning, will the buyer have an incentive to reveal their true, uh, private information truthfully under this mechanism that we have calculated? So you see the idea here is kind of the same as in Myerson mechanism. We 
find this allocation rule by from the virtual surplus expression, and we hope that it satisfies monotonicity. In that case, we had, we at least had some backup option in case it didn't, which is irony, which we discussed earlier today, very briefly. But in this case, there is no real fallback. So you just pray that the statement holds, and that's it. Now there is this paper by Pavan Sigal and Toika from 2014 that I tried to read on many occasions, and I failed every time. And what they do there is they basically provide sufficient conditions on the environment for the statement to hold. But those conditions are numerous, they are very difficult to check, and well, some people who actually can't understand them say that they are too restrictive. I cannot claim that I do, so I will not make those claims. So what we will do today is we will take this cookbook and we will take the approach of praying that this statement holds, and we will say, how can we extract this initial piece of information? How can we extract the initial type theta zero? So the main takeaway that we had before the break, and one of the main takeaways that I want you to take away from today's lecture, is that in, if you're designing a dynamic optimal mechanism, you only need to worry about extracting the initial type theta zero, and you can kind of hope, just justified hope in many cases, uh, that you can extract future information for free and you do not need to tailor your IC constraints for that specifically. However, this may lull you into a false sense of security. So there is one caveat that I want you to be very, very aware of. And this caveat says that future information and future types are not the same thing. So you cannot think that you know all future types. You can, you can assume that you know all future information of the buyer. So what's the difference between the two? Yes, type is some kind of function of the information that the buyer has. I think the most illustrative would be the example, or a few. For one example, suppose that we have two periods, and we sell the item again in every period, but the buyer's valuation does not change over time. So buyer, buyer's valuation for the item in period two is the same as buyer's valuation in period one. Well, I guess in our notation, this is theta zero. So the buyer learns their valuation at the very beginning, then decides whether to participate in the mechanism, then decides whether, what to report in terms of their thetas, get something in period one, then report something maybe else in period two, and get some allocation transfer in period two. Here you can see that there is no information that the buyer learns in period two, in addition to the information that the buyer had in period one or period zero. Meaning that us assuming that we know all future information that the buyer receives after signing up for the mechanism mean, means that we do not know nothing at all. We do not know theta 2 in particular, because theta 2 is part of the information that the buyer had before signing up to the mechanism. Now this example is slightly de degenerate, so let's consider a slightly more interesting example. Suppose we have some AR1 process, so a fancy word of saying like this. There is some inconsistency in, in my notation. Theta 1 is usually the same as theta 0 when I write it. So this is the initial information, and from period 2 onwards, uh, the buyer learns something new. I guess this might have been the reason why I skipped period 1 in, in the description of the model last lecture. Maybe this was not a typo, but it's, it's been too long to remember. So, 
Suppose now that there is a different example in which the buyer starts up with some type theta 0 or theta 1, again, same thing. And then in period 2, the valuation theta 2 is theta 1 plus some random epsilon, say I know, normal noise as usual. Here, the future type is theta 2, but the future information that the buyer gets after signing up for the mechanism is epsilon. So we can assume that we know epsilon, but we cannot assume that we know theta 1, because this is, again, part of the inf initial information of the buyer. So knowing epsilon would give us some information about theta 2, but it's not the same as knowing theta 2 perfect. This was a long and painful way of saying that the initial type, theta 0, that is buyer's private information that we need to extract, can contain some information about the buyer's future types if there is some serial correlation types. So our problem is not simply solving the static problem for period zero. Uh, just do the Meyerson optimal mechanism with payoffs v, uh, u zero, right? And try to extract theta zero. And from that point onwards, everything is free, right? No, we cannot do that. We need to extract knowledge about theta zero from the buyer. But both we, the designer, and the buyer understand that this information is not only valuable in period zero, but it has some value in future periods as well, because it gives you some information about the buyer's future types. And this is basically the main uh, thing to keep in mind when you're doing dynamic optimal mechanisms. So let's try to uh, now do the analogies to, to Meyerson mechanism. Just given this knowledge, in static problem, I wrote it again and I'll write it uh, one more time. The virtual surplus that we uh, had, again, in the new notation, so in the kind of dynamic virtual surplus notation. Remember the inconsistency that we had? Uh, our virtual surplus was looking something like that. So it was just the gains from trade minus the cost of incentives given by this term, the hazard rate and the derivative of utility with respect to the type. So this is real surplus. This is cost of information. You can argue that in now, in our period zero, the problem is pretty much the same. So by waving our heads, we can say that we will have the same virtual surplus. We just need to plug the right things in here. In particular, our real surplus will no longer be V. Our, the sensitivity of the allocation to reports will no longer be measured by this term. So we just need to substitute we need to modify this expression for the dynamic setting. So for dynamic problem, let us define the real surplus in the most intuitive way. So we will call it S, big S for surplus. So it should be the analog of this V, of the real utility that the buyer gets. So it will depend on the allocation. In dynamic setting, it's kappa. And the buyer's full profile of types theta. And it's just the discounted sum of buyer's utilities. So the sum over all periods, t greater than 0, delta to the power t. Delta is our discount factor. And the real, the real utility is V of kT of theta t, theta t. So then if we use this as our measure of real surplus, and if we just plug it into this expression for the virtual surplus, and 
we want to have our virtual surplus as a function of theta zero. So we will have something like virtual surplus, now fully dynamic, of theta zero will be given by S of kappa and theta minus kind of one minus the hazard term for period zero for, for theta zero times the partial derivative of S kappa theta with respect to theta zero. And so the idea is, just as in the static setting, you were choosing k that maximized not the real surplus, but rather this whole virtual surplus, and that was the revenue maximizing allocation rule, part of the optimal mechanism. Same in dynamic setting, your uh, optimal allocation rule kappa will be maximizing this expression. So we are pretty much already there, but we can impose some we can extract some more intuition from this expression, just from the structure of S. In particular, our surplus is just a sum over time, over periods of these. So if we plug it in there, we will get that um, this partial derivative S of kappa theta with respect to theta zero is given by the sum overall feature periods, delta t, partial derivative of v, k, t, theta, t, theta, t, with respect to, we won't take derivative with respect to theta zero, theta zero is not in general in this function, so this v in period t does not depend on theta zero, it only depends on theta t which in turn depends on theta zero. So we're using the chain rule like this. So this particular term is the one that interests us because this is where all the pain comes from. It's how future types depend on our initial type and that's why we need to care about all future periods. So this term in particular has a fancy name. It's called impulse response function. We'll call it I subscript T of theta T given theta T minus one, which is, I don't think I introduced this notation. It's just a vector of types from zero to theta T minus one. So theta zero, so on to theta T minus one. And our impulse response function also depends on kt minus 1, because this might affect, in principle, the distribution of the next period type. So we just define it as this partial derivative. Yeah. So impulse response function, just what is the meaning of it? It tells us, you know, fix this all future information. Fix the realization of all those flips of a coin that uh, the buyer gets to observe and uh, thus infer their future types given theta zero. So fix all that future information. Then given some realization of the future information, how will uh, a change in theta zero affect type theta t? So that's it. That's the whole idea. And we can write this impulse response function in closed form. Uh, we can write it as follows. Now this is the spooky scary expression that we have today on Friday the 13th. So it's the product, yeah, for small s from one to t, of the following scary expression. Partial derivative of the CDF fs Theta s minus 1, k s minus 1, with respect to theta s minus 1, divided by the PDF phi s of theta s given 
on the same terms. So this is just how you write it out in terms of distribution functions, if you ever decide to do such a thing. And in Bergman and Valimaki, they uh, just tell you a little bit about how to actually derive this expression. Cool. So, okay, why, why are we doing all this? I feel like we might be losing track of our purpose here. Our goal is to figure out what hides behind this expression for the virtual surface. In particular, we are looking at this uh, partial derivative of the surplus. And we can now rewrite it through these impulse response functions. So, so this partial derivative is just a little too obscure, and we can simplify it, or not simplify it, but make it more explicit. Cool. So we have computed the impulse response functions. And now we can plug them in. So basically, we can first plug them into this expression for the partial derivative. And then plug this expression for the partial derivative into the virtual surplus. So our virtual surplus of theta 0 will look as follows. Just S of kappa and theta minus 1 minus F 0 of theta 0 times this partial derivative, which we can now represent as the sum of delta to the power t, the impulse response function it, I will not write the arguments, but they are there, times the partial derivative of vt with respect to theta t. Again, I'm not writing the arguments of v, but they are there. And this is not a correct expression, because I... There is a mistake here that I often see in homeworks and I correct every time. Let's count the arguments in the left-hand side and the right-hand side. The left-hand side says that this function only depends on theta zero. Let's try to see what we have in the right-hand side. So we have the allocation rule kappa, and it, okay, it's implicitly fixed. We did the same kind of scene in the uh, in the static setting. So we are assuming that we have fixed some allocation rule cap, which is not really actually true. You know what? Let, let's do that. Let's write this as a function of the allocation rule as well. All right, so we have kappa. Here we have thetas. Is it just theta zero? No, it's actually all thetas right in here, because our surplus does depend on realizations of all thetas, in principle. And the same thing uh, here. So in impulse response functions, we will have dependence on future times. Meaning that our left-hand side only depends on theta zero, our right-hand side depends on all thetas. What do we do in these settings? How do we get rid of Thetas, expectations. So I do not have to write, I do not have the space to write it here, but uh, over theta 1 to theta big T, which is our final period, which may or may not be infinity. And now we should actually remind ourselves that this distribution of future types is conditional on theta zero. So the expectation should be conditional. Okay, and that is that is the expression that you would use out in the wild whenever you need to use, whenever you need to derive an optimal, meaning revenue maximizing mechanism in the dynamic problem. So I feel the confusion. We have the expression for virtual surplus. What do, what, what do we actually do with it? The answer is you do the same thing as in the static setting. So the cookbook is the following. First of all, derive 
this virtual surplus function as a function of kappa and theta zero. It is just a mathematical exercise. You need to write down this expression and just plug in everything. You have the expressions for literally everything in this expression. You know what the surplus is. You know what impulse response functions are. You do that, you take the expectation, easy. Then, what do you do? What do you do with the virtual surplus? What did we do in Myerson static mechanism? We find our optimal allocation rule k for, by maximizing this virtual surplus. So find the optimal kappa, which will be in the argmax of this virtual surplus function. Okay. What was the next step that we did in Myerson mechanism? Here you kind of have a choice in which to do first. But let's stick with the allocation rule. So once you have found the allocation rule, what do you do with it? Monotonicity. Monotonicity. That's right. So in the static setting, you always need to find to check whether this allocation rule that you found here is monotone. In the dynamic setting, we have not said a single word about monotonicity. But it's kind of there. So it's just I guess bleak in comparison to everything else that we do. But in principle, there is a kind of monotonicity uh, requirement. And in principle, you do need to check it. OK, so at this point, we are done with the allocation rules. What, what else do we need to finish describing our optimal mechanism? Now we need to pin down the transfers. And how do we do that? From the envelope representation of pairs. And also from the IR constraint. Because envelope representation of pairs pins down, pins them down up to a constant. And to figure out what that constant is, you need um, IR constraint. So in step four, you find the optimal transfer rule. I believe we called it pi in a dynamic setting from um, the envelope representation of payoffs and the buyer's IR constraint. So this is almost all. Then there is just one final step. Like with monotonicity, we now have this statement to worry about. So you kind of maybe want to check if that actually holds in your problem. So check dynamic IC constraints or IC constraints in periods beyond period one. Or in other words, think, uh, check this future extraction statement. Does it hold? And this is how you find the dynamic optimal mechanism. So, a few things more to mention about this problem. Just more or less a singular relatively disjoint statement. First of all, we argued last time around that, well, this cap of this allocation rule in a dynamic setting is a pretty difficult object. It's a pretty complicated object. And this also means that finding the optimal allocation rule is, in general, a difficult problem. So. We argued that in the context of an efficient allocation rule. But here, the problem is pretty much the same. You just maximize a slightly different function. But you still want to find the allocation rule that maximizes it. So my point here being that this is a difficult problem in general. Because as usual, your choices today will matter what uh, this, what is the net of feasible allocations tomorrow. Uh, your allocations today may somehow affect the distributions of type tomorrow, and so on. So it's a difficult dynamic control problem. Now, we ran in turbo mode 
throughout these three steps without giving any specifics. So just give you a little bit of specifics. Let's talk about this step four. We said that you can find optimal transfers from the envelope representation of payoffs and IR. The trap here is that you have all fallen into many times already, is that there are many different envelope representations of payoffs. So far, we make distinctions between the envelope representation of payoffs for Bayesian mechanisms and for dominant strategies and compatible mechanisms. So that's one distinction. Here, we do not have that distinction because we're only really looking at, well, Bayesian mechanisms, right? We only want the buyer to be truthful given the expectation of what future information they will have, right? But you have buyer in different periods. And buyer has utility in different periods, so you can have envelope representation of payoffs applying to different periods. What is meant here is, of course, the envelope representation of payoffs at time zero or at time one. So at time when the buyer is signing up for the mechanism. Because once again, this is the information we are extracting. These are the AC conditions that we're looking at. We're trying to extract theta zero which means that we'll have IC conditions for buyer to not be willing to misreport theta zero. And the envelope representation of payoffs comes from the IC conditions. So we only really have this envelope representation of payoffs for time zero. Which means that from this condition alone, you are unable to pin down the whole transfer rule. You can only pin down the expected transfers for the agent at time zero. So we cannot find whole, whole pi. You can find the expected as of time zero, um, the sum delta t payment p um, t. So you can find these amounts, which will say if you are type one. At, at, at period zero, then on average throughout the mechanism you will pay this much. If you are slightly different type of type zero, you will have to pay a slightly different amount throughout the mechanism. But you still have the freedom to reallocate this, these payments over periods and over possible histories without within a single period. So you can say, well, you just pay it all up front. Or you, you can pay this in a year, appropriately discounted, of course. Everyone shares a common delta, yes. So both the designer and the buyer have the same discount factor. So really, what you can do to ensure I, I see at future periods is you can reallocate these payments across different histories uh, in the future and try to find this some kind of payment rule that gives you IC in future periods. But for this step, there is no good, um, no good process that I can suggest for you. That would apply universally. So this is just something that you can do in general. Now, another few things apply to this virtual surplus, no, no, not the virtual surplus, but this future information. So as we told, as we said, future info is not the same as future types. And I waved my hands and gave you a few examples to show you what is the distinction between the two. Truth is, we can be a little more precise here. So in the example that I gave you, where we had two periods, and in period two, theta two was just theta one plus some epsilon. Here it's very easy to disentangle what is uh, information from the period one, and what is the information the buyer gets in period two. So this is epsilon that the buyer gets, in, that the buyer observes in period two. But what if this is not a plus, but for example, a product? Then we do not have this clear cut distinction. Truth is, we can still uh, identify. We can still put our finger down on what is the information that the buyer observes in future periods. 
and we can obtain this through the process so-called orthogonalization of information and the idea here is that we will say that the information what yeah the information that the buyer observes in period t is whatever is the part of the distribution of his theta t that is orthogonal to all previous information so basically um, if we let theta t plus one be distributed according to some distribution capital f of t plus one theta t plus one conditional on theta t and kt then we can let our epsilon t plus one the information that the buyer observes it that the player observes in period t plus one to be exactly given by the value of this cdf in this period t plus one so why do we need this epsilon what is it you see that in every period epsilon will have the distribution that is uniform from zero to one conditional on all past objectives meaning that the distribution of epsilon does not depend on anything from the past meaning that if our buyer observes this epsilon they can calculate what their theta t plus one is but our designer does not know anything about this epsilon t plus one meaning we can use this as our future information so the way we will use this epsilon is in our direct relation mechanism so we can set up our direct relation mechanism as follows uh, well there's nothing deep about it the idea is that instead of reporting theta t plus one in every period our player will report epsilon t plus one in every period so what does this give us what does this for some organization of identifying what exactly is the new information to every period what does this give us first of all it is as we want it we wanted the designer to have no information about the future uh, sorry we wanted future types to be completely independent from the initial types because then we can kind of costlessly up extract information about these epsilons from the player so our only real problem was this was in the interconnection of theta zero and theta t and so if for example in the example when theta 2 was equal to theta 1 it would have been a potential problem what if in period 1 the buyer said you know I evaluated 5 and in period 2 the buyer said I evaluated 10 this would not fit our model of the world this would be an off equilibrium path of play this approach also solves that because here uh, whatever epsilon 2 the buyer will report we will know that his theta 2 condition on theta 1 is just theta 1 so we will not change the belief about the player's type so this is a more of a technical note but this is a way to disentangle feature types and feature information epsilons are feature information thetas are feature types final note probably and then we'll start summarizing let's take a look at this virtual surplus expression the thing that I would want to note here is that this term, so discount factor times the impulse response, go to zero with time. Meaning that if our future types do not really depend that much on theta zero, or at least this dependence does not get stronger, then the discount factor can discount away then this whole second term converges to zero so the cost of providing incentives for the player to reveal the feature type in very far away periods 
is basically zero, meaning that in those faraway periods, maximizing virtual surplus for that period is equivalent to maximizing the actual surplus. So this is another way to see that in the very distant future, we do want to select the efficient allocation rule. So this shows that KT approaches the KT optimal approaches the efficient allocation rule as T goes to infinity. Cool. So we do have one more topic uh, in dynamic mechanisms. I just wanted to show you three completely different papers that nonetheless have a very similar topic, that a very similar theme, a very similar lesson uh, that is relevant to dynamic mechanism design. I guess we will do that next week. So we'll just chip a little bit of the next lecture to talk about dynamic mechanisms and wrap up our discussion. But for today, let's try to wrap up what we learned. We talked about the dynamic optimal mechanisms for pretty much all of today. And I know the discussion was abstract and at the same time not precise enough. So I wanted to really try to systematize the takeaways. So what are the takeaways? We need to separate the information that the buyer had before starting the mechanism and the information that arrives afterwards. So separate data zero and future information. And only theta zero needs to be extracted by the mechanism. Future information can be learned for free. And yes, we can write that. Future information is not the same as future types. Future information is the epsilons. The second takeaway, as the consequence of this, if we do not need to bear the cost of extracting future information of the agent, it means that we are just maximizing the surplus that uh, is generated by our future allocations, meaning that we would want to select the efficient allocation rule uh, in future periods. Right, as a consequence of the first one to some extent. Uh, K optimal converges to the efficient allocation of K star T uh, as T goes to infinity. Uh, if our big distribution F is nice enough or is not too bad. And to linger a little bit on this takeaway, the only reason why, for example, in the infinite period model, the allocation we choose in period two or in period three is not efficient, is to provide incentives to for the agent to reveal theta zero. Right? So it's only with this link between theta zero and future thetas that distorts the allocation that we choose. I really want to hammer this home. And the final lesson is that we only need to extract theta zero, and we do that using the analog of Myers and optimal mechanism. And I think this should be it for today.